share your yes. slide. And um, you have a 17 minutes plus three minutes. So I'll give you a uh, notice two minutes before the end of your talk time. Okay, just confirm you can see the screen. You can see it, yes. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I'm going to give you um, a glimpse onto our most recent results still unpublished, trying to incorporate the evolution of fossil relativistic electron into the simulation of basically large scale structures, galaxy clusters in cosmology. Um, just to give you a little bit of context, why should we bother about radio galaxies in large scale structures? So they are, of course, a very fascinating object, kind of object uh, capable of coupling tremendously different radio scales. We all know that. I'm going to, to tell you also why I think it's relevant now to start incorporating them consistently in cosmological models, in cosmological simulation. So a first good reason is that uh, they provide a source of monetization. We knew that already, of course. Um, what has been only clear, I guess, since recent observation is that if the any primordial magnetic field is lower than 0 0.1 roughly nano gauss co-moving, then the monetization uh, provided by radio galaxies is, comp is uh, competitive with that sort of monetization on the scale of filaments. So if we want to detect filaments or use filaments as signposts for uh, primordial magnetization, we should also uh, put into account that if there is a radio galaxy uh, producing jets within a filament or close to a filament, that signature can be at the same level. And therefore, we need now to incorporate them self consistently in simulation to be able to tell apart the two contribution. Uh, of course, there can there also might be zero primordial field, but if we want to detect it, we, we should also be sure of what cannot be due to primordial fields and what should be put there by radio galaxies. For example, if you if you compute in our simulation, the typical magnetization is a function of cosmic overdensity, you start seeing that at the typical scale of filaments, that's an overdensity of order time, which is typical of filaments, the magnetic field you would expect from primordial fields start to be of the same order of astrophysical um, sources of uh, magnetic fields like AGNs or star formation. And since these limits now are going down and they should be like 0.1 nano gauss, uh, given um, many present limits, uh, they are at the same level of what radio galaxies should produce. And also very interesting work that has been already mentioned a couple of times this morning, at least where I live, uh, is, the re is this recent um, works try to detect the essentially the structure function of rotation measure from the lobes of distant radio galaxies and try to understand if from that information we can get a, an idea of the amount of rotation measurement provided by the intergalactic medium, so external to the, to the lobes of radio galaxies. That's uh, work by Shane O'Sullivan using LOFAR. And the interesting result is that um, present LOFAR seems to imply that either the primordial field should be lower to a fraction of a nano gauss, or that signature can be compatible with what radio galaxy should be able to put there. A second reason is how um, that we need radio galaxies to understand how uh, large scale radio emissions are formed. And sorry for the music here. I'm going to show this beautiful movie that has just won uh, the, the first prize for the best image basically on the NRAO this year. is worked by Gianandrea Inkingolo, Denis Vitor, Chiara Stuardi, Kamles Rashproit and many other people in Bologna. It's the rendering of a simulation. What you see here are a bunch of electrons getting shocked. Then we have the simulation of radio emission and uh, there are situations in which you can actually fade this emission onto real observed um, diffuse radio emission structure. This is a radio relic uh, observed by Chiara Stuart. In this case, is the VLA. And next, we will have the toothbrush radio relic, again observed uh, with the VLA. So what is important is that we have more or less um, a good understanding, I would say, on, on, on how um, the dissipation of kinetic energy, either through shocks or turbulence, can actually uh, give rise to these morphologies. What we are consistently missing in many cases, but one maybe, is the fact that to explain the normalization of the emission, we always need to put a, a fairly large amount of fossil electrons. So either shocks or turbulence, depending on the kind of sources we are analyzing. 
need to have a pre-existing population of fossil electrons, fossil meaning uh, once relativistic now more or less uh, with energy of the order of a few hundred MeV, uh, because otherwise both shock acceleration or tubular acceleration won't be able to explain the normalization of the emission we, we observe. And several recent observations, mostly using low frequency, the low frequency window have um, indeed unveil possible connections from remnant of AGN activity and uh, the basically the appearance of diffuse radio sources. So we need to simulate them. Uh, of course, simulating radio galaxies and the evolution of jets is a very, uh, a very rich uh, field of research, uh, which has been first dominated and probably still is dominated by single object simulation. So without having cosmology, we initialize jets in like hydrostatic um, atmospheres and having single object we can put a lot of emphasis on resolution physics we can deal with small scale instabilities we can have a lot of ingredients what we miss typically is the impact of uh, large scale structure formation like uh, shocks uh, being driven by mergers or just cluster weather which can actually bend and change the energetics and the morphology of jets um, there are there are fewer cosmological simulations incorporating all um, most important ingredients to have radio galaxies. I would dare to say no cosmological simulation so far could have at the same time full MHD, so magnetic field evolution, relativistic particles, and self-consistent recipes to couple uh, AGN feedback and the release of relativistic electrons. So far, basically, um, magnetic fields and relativistic particles have been regarded in, co in cosmological simulations like I don't know, the frost on the cake or the dessert after dinner. Uh, but the most important part having a nutritious meal was something regardless of my native. Well, maybe you notice it. we are close to dinner time here. Uh, but so now we are going for the dessert. So we try to include and have actually a primary focus on radio galaxies in fully cosmological simulation. This is a set of new simulation done with ENZO and uh, a grid uh, adaptive measure refinement code as an example of a radio jet. This would be what we call here run two. I'm not going to, to spend much time on all these parameters. What you see here is the synchrotron radio emission evolving as a function of time. And you can see where the brighter spots are evolving as a function of time. At the beginning, the jet is fairly collimated and then it's distorted by cluster weather. You have inflated bubbles, etc. And in this simple case, the emission is going down by orders of magnitude because we just have the initial expansion and basically nothing else. We start imposing a spectrum which is compatible with typical radio galaxies, and, th and then here we let the simulation evolve. Um, this was, however, not a single object simulation. This was the jet um, image staying, basically sitting on the reference frame of the supermassive black hole that was initialized in the simulation, but the full picture will be more like, like this. So this is actually evolving in a simulation. You also could see probably here at the beginning the carving of cavities. And this is just evolving in a high resolution simulation of the galaxy clusters. And now we have tools that's the same object uh, along a different line of sight. Now we are looking at the system through basically through the initial jet direction. So the jet would be pointing towards us. Um, still, we are limited by computing resources, like the maximum resolution is not tremendously high, is only nine kiloparsec. Everything is full MHD. There is no cooling and no star formation. So we cannot describe in a self-consistent way the coupling between feedback and also the release of radio jets. Here we are initializing um, basically supermassive black hole particles. But since we, are, we don't have cooling, we are deciding, OK, let's have the supermassive black hole producing jet at a given redshift with a decent uh, energetic. And then we, we just see how the remnant of this um, injection are evolving in time. And to do that, we use passive tracers. We can really follow single electrons in a Lagrangian approach with a code by Dennis Vitor in Hamburg. And we are also evolving using a focal Planck method, the evolution of relativistic electrons in the presence of different sources of um, acceleration or cooling. And we can therefore test, for example, separately the impact of different acceleration um, channels like shock acceleration, shock reacceleration, compression, or turbulence. Um, this would be for a source that is uh, first released at redshift uh, 0 0.5. And this is another source in the same cluster, but seen at, a, at an early, earlier epoch, sorry, in which we instead initialize jets at redshift 1. So you probably, you, 
if you remember what was happening in the previous video, there is a, definitely a different evolution here. Uh, the jets have si a similar power, but they are shining essentially in a cluster which has a lower mass, a lower pressure, and therefore a good fraction of jets can actually escape the cluster and diffuse to a much larger volume. So we can actually also start studying what's the impact of jet power on cluster uh, of a different mass or in the same cluster, but with jets acting on different epochs, essentially. Uh, one important point is how do we classify those jets? Uh, I was trying um, to classify those morphologies basically by eye, but my observer's friend basically told me, shut up. So we try to do, I try to do something more automatic. So inspired by recent work uh, using big surveys, I'm quoting here, for example, the one by Mingo uh, 19 and Vardulaki 19. I try some a more automated approach. So basically I was with a small aperture in the, in the jet um, sector, I was computing how far from the core of the, of the galaxy, say the supermassive black hole, the, the brightest spot of emission was found. And this gives um, an indication if the, 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 the source is more an F, uh, Farron uh, Riley type two or type one source. And basically the first source you saw is what is run uh, to here. And basically most of the time this source would be classified an FR2 galaxy. And the second one uh, goes through phases. It depends because the, the brightest spot along the jet can be found at different location also because of the interaction with the surrounding medium. Um, it's not tremendously important any way to classify the galaxies at this point because we are not still doing uh, like big survey and, and, and many objects that we need to classify, but that's a challenge for the future. It's interesting to notice how far can gas particles travel if we have or not a jet. This would be the same parent simulation, but without any jet. So this is the pure advection of gas particles located basically in the central galaxy that are just moving as a function of accretion. So they can spread to a large radius. To give you an idea, this would be roughly four megaparsec from side to side. That's the same cluster, but instead we have the jet. And again, we are looking at it, in this case, in the direction of the jet itself. And you can easily see that here, material can be spread at much, much larger distances. This is not entirely an effect of the jet itself. The jet can place basically gas particles at typical radii in the cluster volume at which turbulence is stronger. So basically um, they can uplift gas in a region in which turbulent diffusion induced by accretion processes would increase even more the diffusion of particles. But at redshift zero, that's a difference in the distribution of particles. This is not a radio weighted information. This is just the particles that are there, only a small fraction of those will be actually living in a jet and would be radio emitting. Uh, just to give you a number, we can measure the maximum distance and we can see that by the end of the simulation, the simulation having just one jet can displace particles typically at a radius which is like 60% larger. And if you turn that into a volume, it's a much, much larger volume. What we can also study is how jets can change the, for example, magnetic or thermal properties of the gas. And what is interesting is that if we compare the run without radio jets, would be the blue here, or the one with radio jet, one radio jet, the red one, we can find that particles connected to jets are keeping a very different magnetic field by almost an order of magnitude for several giga years. Like the distance from here to here will be like two giga years in time. Instead, their temperature is quickly settled to the same temperature of the no jet case, meaning they are very efficiently mixing with the intercluster medium. That's no surprise because AGN feedback is exactly supposed to provide thermal energy to the intercluster medium. So it's no surprise that if we overpressurize those regions, they would actually uh, mix with the intercluster medium rather fast because it's what AGN feedback is supposed to do. But instead, their non thermal contribution would survive longer. The interesting part is that if we can access that information as you would do in radio, and especially in a low frequency window, you can connect. Uh, past AGN activities uh, much longer in time. You can actually trace somehow the, the information at least two giga years ago. Even if in if you look at the same cluster in X-ray, you wouldn't you wouldn't see trace, the traces of AGN feedback anymore. Basically, then how do we solve the evolution of particles? We have this set of equations that we solve through a standard Fokker-Planck equation. We have different. I mean, old standard losses term plus we have acceleration term that we take from 
diffusive shock acceleration theory. We have shock condition and we decide how many electrons are going to be injected. Not very relevant in anything, in anything I'm showing uh, here because we don't have very strong shocks. And we can also incorporate the very slow effect. You can see here the time scales are very long. The very slow effect of reacceleration by turbulence in the latest flavor explored by Brunetti and Lanzari and that Simona already mentioned to explain the bridge in ABLE 399401. Three minutes. Okay, thanks. That's a typical evolution. It's the same source. Again, we can see here on the right, the evolution. Uh, if, you, if you let the particle be accelerated by different mechanisms, so you, get, you can get an idea if you allow turbulence and shocks, you, you can keep a fraction of particles much more energetic compared to the simple loss in a diabatic expansion case, or you can also track what's going to happen at the different um, at particles coming from different jets. So for example, you can see that one of the two spectra is getting reaccelerated by a shocks before the other because shocks are going from basically right to left in the simulation. So you can easily see the passage of shock through the population of fossil electrons. Then it's very interesting now to measure spectral indices. Uh, that's a movie showing how the population of this um, of this source be light at the redshift one is going to fade and getting steeper and steeper over time. And what is I think is very interesting is that actually through this experiment and future one, we can actually check if the distribution of spectral indices that can be already now observed at low frequency, for example, in LOFAR, a lot of work in, in recent articles, if we can connect a particular distribution of spectral indices to the mechanisms which are acting in a diffusive intracluster medium. So not something just related to the aging of particles, but to the interplay between intracluster medium uh, weather, say, and those particles. And, and you can, the difference here is not enormous, but in other cases, it, it is more, more prominent. If you are letting shocks and turbulence interact with those particles, you can, you can push spectra to be flatter than, than they are, of course, if you only have cooling. And for example, very interesting, uh, interestingly, recently, uh, Boteon and collaborator using LOFAR um, got this relation between spectral index uh, and X-ray emission for, for the, the beautiful mass cluster, able to 255. And for example, it would be a struggle for the model we just saw, um, saw to get the same relation. We get something which is not as steep as in, um, in real observation and actually this, the slope of this relation would change a lot if we can the ingredients. Um, other thing the simulation can help us, and actually that's this last, last slide, is to deal with projection effects. Projection effects are, I think, an issue to solve if you want to model, for example, the aging of, aging of sources. That's exactly the same source. This would be the spectral index. And you can get very different information, very different pattern, just because you are rotating your line of sight. And it's also not clear to me, but of course, I'm going to test it as soon as I can. If the age estimate we can get based on equipartition will be always consistent because you vary the line of sight, you introduce uh, diffuse mechanisms to keep particles more energetic, and then you would like to see if this is consistent or not with uh, age estimate you can get either from, from, the, from the break in the spectrum or equipartition hypothesis. And it's not clear. Uh, if everything can be made consistent, especially in these very complex sources, but simulations are basically there to help. So that's my last slide. Um, so radio galaxies, I think, are a fundamental tool if you want to understand how magnetic fields and relativistic electrons are seeded in simulation. And this is not like a super theoretical point is what we need to understand, for example, the absolute power of radio sources. And low frequency observation are the best to constrain and the, the steepening of spectra at, at low frequency, low power, and connect them with the past of AGN activity and past processes of the intercluster medium. And this entire thing poses many fun challenges for future or imminent cosmological simulation. Thanks for your attention. And yeah, I'm done with that. Thank you. That was fantastic stuff. Really, really nice. Um, we're running a little short on time, but we do have one question in the Q&A, and then I'd encourage folks to uh, join the coffee and, and use the Slack, too. Um, the question uh, by Pratik is, in radio galaxy simulations, to what extent, kiloparsec or megaparsec, do the lobes expand to before losing its shape? And um, also, do we have information on the mass of the local galaxy cluster into which it's simulated? 
okay this cluster has a final mass at ratio zero of i guess 3 10 to the 14 m100 so i would call it probably a galaxy group and, but when the jets are first launched of course it's much smaller so especially in the ratio one case it's still it's a group before realization so it's no surprise that if the jet power is able to actually push one of the two low basically outside of the cluster and i cannot answer very quantitatively to the to, to the question because it depends in on one case the lobes are soon disrupted in the other they get they're actually kept inside the cluster and i would say they could survive a couple of giga years as a shape if they are visible or not it really depends if you want them to drain some energy from the intercluster medium or not so this is still work in progress i would say great thank you um i'll ask you to stop sharing i think we'll need to move on um thank you so the the next talk is by um eric osinga on um, diffuse radio emission from galaxy clusters in the low far two meter sky survey deep fields. If you can share your screen. Yes, is my video working? Because it seems frozen for me, but. We don't see anything. Mm -hmm. Maybe try sharing your screen. Oh, there we are, Eric, it's coming. Yeah, I um, restarted it. Okay, that's good. Uh, let me try sharing. Uh, yes. Uh, are you seeing the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. All right. So thanks for allowing me the opportunity to give a talk. Um, my name is Eric. I'm a PhD student at Leiden Observatory in the LOFAR group. And I'll be presenting a paper that's currently under review, um, which is searching for diffuse radio emission from galaxy clusters in the LOFAR 2 meter sky survey deep fields. And this paper is part of a paper splash of more than 10 papers that are all related to the LOFAR uh, deep fields. And the preprint's already available on archive if you're interested in that. And the preprint of all the other papers are also available on archive. So I'll start by introducing what I mean by the diffuse radio emission. So as Simona showed, um, there are basically three types of diffuse radio emission from galaxy clusters. First of all, there are the radio halos, which are the very large megaparsec size structures that are in the center of galaxy clusters. Um, these have a radio brightness distribution that roughly follows the X-ray of the hot uh, cluster gas. Then there are radio shocks, which are uh, tracing actual shocks on the outskirts of clusters. And uh, there's the fossil AGN plasma, which uh, we just heard a very extensive uh, presentation about. And in this talk, I'll be mainly focusing on uh, radio halos. And the thing with radio halos, because they are so large and the uh, relativistic electrons that power these radio halos, their, their lifetime is quite short, so they lose energy quite fast. There is a need for some in situ, so in place mechanism that generates the uh, radio halos. And therefore, there are basically two uh, main models that could. Uh, that have been thought up to uh, circumvent this lifetime problem. First, there's the hadronic model, which uh, states that the relativistic electrons are secondary products of collisions between relativistic protons and the thermal ICM, so protons uh, from the thermal pool of the cluster. Um, and this circumvents this lifetime problem that electrons have because thermal protons are very, or sorry, Relativistic protons are much longer lived. They lose their energy much less quickly. Um, so these can uh, accumulate over the lifetime of a cluster and then via particle collisions uh, produce all kinds of secondary particles uh, such as pions. And these pions decay to uh, relativistic electrons. But a key prediction of this model is that we should also see gamma ray emission from the pions. Uh, because they are unstable and they, they decay as well. Um, but this has not really clearly been observed in many galaxy clusters yet. So um, yeah, we have some upper limits of the gamma ray emission, but um, it's very hard then uh, to merge this with the current hadronic model. So therefore the current favorite model is the turbulent reacceleration model, which um, circumvents the problem by a population of seed electrons through turbulence in the cluster medium. And this turbulence is generally 
caused by uh, mergers of clusters. So for the second model, we would also expect to see a correlation between radio halos and mergers, and this has indeed been observed. Um, yeah, so that model is uh, probably, at least for what we've seen, uh, the dominant one. But both models predict that as we go to lower mass clusters, we should see uh, a smaller fraction of radio halos. Um, so actually all of our knowledge or most of our knowledge is based on uh, diffuse emission that was found in clusters above uh, five times 10 to the 14 solar masses. I'll just use this value as a cutoff for what I call low mass clusters and high mass clusters. Um, and a unique prediction of the turbulent model is that we should see also ultra steep spectrum radio halos. Um, so as we go to lower and lower frequencies, these should light up more preferentially. Um, so this drop in occurrence should be less significant if we go to uh, lower frequencies. And uh, what's also very interesting is that less massive clusters have less uh, energetic mergers. They have a smaller turbulent energy budget. So it might be that at some point we're going to probe a transition where um, halos are not mainly generated by the turbulent model or maybe just that the hadronic model becomes a bit more important. So for these reasons, it's very important to look at low mass clusters. We've only really probed like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, diffuse emission from clusters. And actually most clusters in the universe are lower mass clusters, but it's just that we've been a bit biased because the heaviest ones are also the brightest. And it's important uh, to look at these at low frequencies because they shine brighter. That's what we expect. So um, this is why the low far deep fields are very uh, actually a perfect tool to look at this. So the low far deep fields are very long uh, pointed observations of three famous fields, the ELISA and one field, the Lockman hole and the Buddhist field. Um, yeah, over hundreds uh, of hours of observations in total. Um, at the low far HBA frequency range, so 120 to 168 megahertz. And these are the, the deepest images that we have at these frequencies. So uh, if you see on the plots on the right, where the, the y-axis is RMS noise versus free, and the x-axis is frequency, you can see that um, compared with some other dedicated deep pointings, uh, even at higher frequencies, we have the, the low far deep fields has a lower RMS value. And when you assume a canonical spectral index of uh, 0.7, then we're, the low far deep fields are the deepest images that we have uh, to look at uh, these kind of sources. And the diffuse radio emission is usually steeper than 0.7. So yeah, this is really good candidates to look at, uh, at this stuff. So a uh, big question is, uh, what can we find? Um, so uh, what I did was I took the images of the low far deep fields and I looked at three major cluster catalogs. So the second Planck catalog of Sanyev Sodovic detected sources, the meta catalog of X-ray detected clusters of galaxies and the combined Planck Rosette on Sky Survey catalog of X-ray and SC detected clusters. And we found 12 clusters that overlap with, um, with that are within two and a half degrees of our pointing centers. And within these clusters, we have found three radio halos, eight cases where no diffuse emission was picked up and one sort of uncertain case. Um, I'll get to that uh, later. Halo flux density calculator, and it's an MCMC uh, fitting method that fits these uh, surface brightness profiles in the image plane, so in the 2D plane. And it's very nice because it allows us to do all sorts of different models. Uh, we can fit elliptical halos and it, we can fit um, asymmetrical profiles. But for this paper, we just decided to keep it simple and fit uh, spherically symmetric profiles. So we fit exponential profiles um, 
with the formula that is uh, shown below. Um, so it has basically, well, two main parameters, the central surface brightness, uh, I0, and the e-folding radius of a radio halo. And uh, the flux density is then easily calculated by just integrating the model. And an advantage of fitting these profiles, uh, as opposed to what's usually done, is measuring the flux density within um, maybe 500 kiloparsec or measuring the flux density within, uh, let's say, three sigma contours, is that uh, now we're, we're getting properties that are relatively independent of the noise level of the images. Because as you go deeper, your three sigma contours will, um, they will change, but your e-folding radius won't change if you have good, a good enough signal to noise, of course, to fit this. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm, our model has, well, it has four parameters. So the central surface brightness, the e-folding radius, and the position, the central, the center of the halo, basically. So we get plots like these where we uh, see the, uh, the MCMC chain that's, uh, that's been walking around the parameter space. All right, so what have we found? As I mentioned, we found three radio halos, um, but two of them were already discovered in previous uh, single low for observations and eight hour observations. So, uh, well, maybe a bit unfortunate, but also uh, a way to, for us to test whether what we are doing is correct and what, whether the results in the literature make sense, I guess. So uh, the, first, uh, the first of the radio halos is this uh, high redshift cluster. That's actually also in the sample that Gabriella will talk about uh, in the next or the talk after that. Um, it's a mass six and a half times 10 to the 14 solar masses cluster. And we basically find consistent flux values with what uh, Gabriela has found, indicating that the, the point source subtraction that we're doing and the fitting that we're doing is uh, making sense. So on the right, I show this uh, optical overlay and the low resolution uh, contours of the radio emission. Uh, the second one is ABLE 1132. This is a spectacular cluster that's also been uh, shown a little bit in the previous uh, presentations. And um, for this one as well, we find uh, consistent flux densities with what Amanda Wilbur had found in 2017. We find that the radio halo is a bit bigger than what they found, but that's uh, understandable as we go deeper, of course. Um, so the third case, this is the, this is the one that's uncertain. Uh, so this is the uh, uncertain branch of the of the 12 clusters. Uh, this is quite a low mass system, uh, 2.7 times 10 to the 14 solar masses at a redshift of 0.13. And um, our signal to noise is not really high here. So the contours are drawn at two and four sigma. And the radio emission is also not very large. We're fitting an e-folding radius of about 60 kiloparsec and the total extent of the radio emission is maybe 100 or 150 kiloparsec. So it's kind of hard to say whether this is, it's very hard to say whether this is uh, AGN related emission or maybe it's um, the central brightest part of a, of a mini halo and the rest is embedded in the noise. Um, so for this, for this one, we're uncertain and we're uh, not really giving a classification as to what we think this is. And then there's the one new detection which is this MCXC cluster. So uh, it's a cluster that's only detected in the X-ray catalog that we used. And this was really mysterious when I first looked at it, because um, if I believe the X-ray catalog, it has a mass lower than one times 10 to the 14 solar masses at a redshift of 0.2. But um, in the radio contours, it's really a huge extended diffuse blob of emission. And it's quite bright as well if you're um, if you're thinking about such a low mass system emitting uh, quite bright radio flux, then uh, this, is, uh, this is quite a mystery. But uh, after looking into this in a bit more detail, um, we realized that uh, actually two of the sources, two of the optical sources in the, in the optical image, they have an SDSS spectroscopic redshift. And this places the optical sources at about a redshift of 0.77. Um, and if you're a little bit familiar with looking at the optical images, you can also see that there seems to be more of an overdensity of red sources than there is of nearby 
uh, sources. And indeed, when you're uh, uh, when we query photometric redshifts in a region uh, around the cluster, we can see that there is indeed an overdensity and around redshift 0 0.6, 0 0.7, rather than a redshift of 0.2. So it's quite likely that the automatic uh, catalog creation went wrong in this case, and that it's at a high redshift. Um, and then recalibrating the relation between the X-ray flux and the mass, we get a mass estimate of 3 times 10 to the 14 solar masses. So it's a giant, uh, it's a giant uh, piece of emission, about a megaparsec in size. So we classify it as a radio halo. And it's in a low mass cluster at high redshift. So that's very, uh, very interesting. And the non-detection of the Planck catalog also makes sense in this context, uh, because Planck is quite incomplete at these redshifts below a mass of 7 times 10 to the 14 solar mass. So we're quite sure that it's at least below this mass. And it's around 3, maybe 4 times 10 to the 14 uh, solar masses. So that's pretty cool. Um, what about the non-detections? Um, so for the clusters that are sort of in the same mass range, we also uh, injected mock halos, so fake halos, into the data. And we saw when we could recover them. And these are the upper limits that are given uh, in this plot. So this is the classic relation between the radio power at 1.4 gigahertz and the host cluster mass. Um, and these are all points from the literature taken, uh, in, two, uh, taken in 1.4 gigahertz. And this is the best, best fit um, by Cassano in 2013. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thanks. That's great. And um, we don't really have a good unbiased sample to say whether we're really deviating from this um, from this line yet, and we don't really have a big enough sample to say whether we are deviating from this line yet. But the thing I would like you to take away from this plot is that we're really starting to uh, probe this region more to the left side of the plot um, in the low mass regime. And this is also around sort of the radio luminosities where we uh, are expecting a transition to maybe hadronic halos uh, to happen. So this is quite interesting, um, very, uh, very interesting to see how this will uh, evolve. And that's basically my conclusion. So I showed you um, a search for uh, diffuse radio emission in the deepest low frequency images that we have ever taken. Uh, we detected one new radio halo in a low mass cluster uh, at high redshifts. And this is really showing the power of deep and low frequency observations to uh, get new uh, information from uh, systems that we hadn't observed before. And actually, we're not even at the final depths yet of the low far deep fields. So as of now, there are already observations scheduled or taken to double the amount of hours that we have. And uh, in total, the final goal of the deep fields is about 500 hours per field. So this is going to be really exciting and uh, be interesting to see what uh, comes out of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. That That's great. Really nice to see. And that's an amazing depth that these fields are reaching um, at these frequencies. So um, I encourage folks to to raise their hands if there are questions. Um, I'll start uh, with the question that uh, Joe Lazio put in the, um, the Q&A, which was, um, since your work um, is looking for diffuse counterparts to known X-ray and SZ clusters, could you actually use um, the images to conduct a blind search for diffuse radio emission? in low mass clusters uh, that might have been missed by other approaches to identifying clusters? Um, I guess you could. Um, I think it's very hard to come up with a method that would automatically find a cluster diffuse emission when you don't know yet where the clusters are. So what we did do was also visually look through the images um, to just see, do we spot anything obvious? Um, and that's, we didn't spot, but um, 
I mean, yeah, the images are quite big and there's a lot of sources in there, but it's really hard to find an automatic algorithm that will discern a radio halo from uh, a big radio lobe. And also given the fact that these things intertwine um, in a lot of cases, maybe it could be done, but it's probably very hard. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> we have another question uh, from Namir. How's the noise decreasing as you go deeper and deeper? Is yeah, it like I'm thermal pretty, noise? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're reaching thermal noise levels. Uh, Philip Best will talk more about the deep fields in session 10 tomorrow. Um, there's been a lot of work on this and there are, I think, three, at least two or three papers just describing the uh, whole calibration strategy. So um, I think we're reaching thermal noise, yes. Okay. And um, I just had a question about the, the time that it's taking to do, to reach these levels. Do you have sort of an estimate of the processing time needed to reach this for these fields? Um, I, I'm not sure. So I can give you uh, an idea with, so a method that we used was to um, extract small regions from the entire data uh, so that we could quickly recalibrate um, the regions of interest because we're not, we're not gonna recalibrate the whole field just because we want a different UV taper, for example. And this extraction process took about two weeks per cluster. Um, so that's just in a, a small field of view, like a half a degree by a half a degree. So extracting the UV data from that and then running self-cal on it again took about two weeks. So um, it's a lot of computing time um, already for these small uh, cells. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you. Um, again, I encourage conversations to continue at coffee after. I think we now need to move on uh, to our next speakers. So if you can stop sharing. And uh, next we have Marisa Brianza. Um, you can uh, start sharing your screen yeah. and um, AGN feedback caught in the app, LOFAR and eRosita observations of a galaxy group. We can see your screen. Yeah, can you can you um, hear me too? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. So, hello everybody. Uh, thanks first of all to the organizers for giving me the chance to present these um, new results uh, on this very spectacular galaxy group that we have recently uh, studied with the uh, LOFAR and the uh, Erosita observations. Uh, before uh, going into the details of this group, uh, just let me um, give you a very sh a small introduction on AGN jets and mechanical feedback, uh, even though both uh, Sarah, Sarah in the previous session uh, um, and, uh, and Simona um, in, at the beginning of this session have already uh, made a very, uh, some, some introduction for me. So uh, AGN jets, uh, you know, expand throughout uh, the interstellar medium of their host galaxy first, but, th but then can also uh, go through um, the intergalactic or intracluster medium that, that surrounds uh, the, the host galaxy. And doing, by doing so, they uh, displace, uh, they push away the, the thermal gas of the ACM and create these cavities in the uh, X-ray surface brightness uh, distribution of the ICM, as you can see in this example on the right uh, of a very famous source. Um, then uh, at some point the jets switch off um, and what happens at this point or even when the, bu the buoyancy velocity of the um, exceeds the jet expansion velocity uh, without the jets being properly stopped what happens to the loops is that they start rising in the ICM as buoyant bubbles and they keep rising moving away from the from the host galaxy um, to date, uh, we have detected uh, uh, a multitude of these signatures of these cavities and bubbles uh, in many, many systems, uh, starting from many um, very massive systems, very massive uh, gal uh, galaxy clusters, where most of the detections actually are 
uh, are found. Uh, but uh, um, it's good to mention that also in low mass systems we see cavities and uh, I'm talking about galaxy groups but even individual elliptical uh, massive uh, galaxies and um, this gives you gives us an idea of the fact that AGN jets can really be uh, relevant in over a broad range of uh, of um, of, of systems. Uh, in some cases, uh, we even see multiple pairs of cavities, uh, which we interpret uh, as uh, the evidence of recurrent AGN outbursts. Uh, why we care so much about this? Uh, because these cavities, these bubbles, can give us some uh, um, answers um, to and some numbers about uh, the AGN jet mechanical uh, feedback, and in particular using the bubble power uh, computed as the, um, the work performed by the bubble to push away the ICM divided by its rising time, uh, comparing this power uh, to the X-ray luminosity, uh, we can uh, um, we can see that we can find a very uh, nice correlation, and this, uh, as you can see in the plot here, and this really suggests that uh, the energetic impact of the AGN jets can really counterbalance the ICM cooling, at least uh, in low, in uh, high mass systems. But uh, uh, there are, let's say, evidence that uh, even in uh, lower mass system, does, this must be the, the case. Um, while this is a quite, I would say, consolidated picture, uh, there are still, as usually happens, open questions that we would like to address, things that we would like to understand more. And uh, among these uh, um, are the bubble composition. We don't know much about how these bubbles are, are composed and we don't know much about how these bubbles evolve, uh, also about the mechanism that actually converts the uh, bubble's power into heat uh, that is transferred to the ICM, and a lot about the microphysics of the ICM and the thermal plasma interaction is not known, uh, including the role of magnetic fields and viscosity, for example. So having said that, let's go to um, let me introduce you to this uh, galaxy group that we have studied uh, that you can see here in this uh, beautiful uh, LOPAR image that uh, we have uh, performed uh, using uh, uh, observations at uh, 144 MHz. And uh, here you see uh, uh, an image at 6 or second resolution. This is a largely unknown galaxy group uh, that was identified based on uh, two mass, so an infrared uh, uh, catalog, and consists of about 20 galaxies and has a mass of about uh, 10 to the 14 solar masses. At the center of the system, as uh, open happens, uh, there is a massive elliptical galaxy uh, at redshift 0.018. And this is associated with a radio galaxy, uh, in particular a low excitation radio galaxy. But uh, as you can see, all around uh, on much larger scales, there is a lot more of diffuse emission, which I will be describing to you in a moment. We were lucky enough to uh, have access to Erosita data, very new data. Uh, that allowed us to observe the, the, this galaxy group at X-ray frequencies. And here you can see the X-ray map where the group is clearly detected. Um, by comparing the X-ray and the uh, radio dis emission distribution, we can see some hints of anti-correlation, although um, they are not conclusive with the current data we have. Uh, with this X-ray data, we could manage. Uh, we sorry, we uh, could compute the the temperature of the ICM, which is about uh, two keV, and the luminosity of the ICM, which is about 10 to the 42 Earth per second. The mass of the system, the resulting mass of the system, is about 10 to the 14 solar masses, as uh, uh, already um, derived from the infrared uh, luminosity. So let me go back now to the LOPAR image, um, where you can see a very complex uh, morphology uh, with the many different features that uh, 
I will try to describe uh, now. So let me start from the very center region. Uh, if you look at the panel in the bottom left, uh, there is a zoom in on the central radio galaxy, uh, which, uh, as said before, is uh, coincident with the optical um, elliptical galaxy sitting at this, uh, the group center. Uh, this is a classical, let's say, double lobed radio source extending for uh, 25 kiloparsec. At the very center, if you uh, look closely, there are even two more components, compact components, which might suggest some uh, new ejections is taking place. And all around uh, the, the compact double, uh, there is a, a very blobby diffuse uh, emission, which we interpret as out, which we call outer lobes, and we interpret as remnant uh, lobes of previous uh, AGN activity. But beyond that, there is much more. Uh, the emission actually extends uh, over more than 400 kiloparsecs, and it's very complex, uh, full of filamentary structures and bendings. Uh, among these, I just mentioned the main filament in the north, which extends uh, for about 350 kiloparsec and is um, really probing the coherence of magnetic field over large uh, distances. Uh, very, impressive is, very impressive is also this box-shaped filament in the north. Uh, the, south is, uh, the morphology in the south is instead more undefined. Finally, I draw your attention to the fact that there is some bridges of emission that connects what we call the outer lobes with the filamentary uh, structures on larger scales. If we image the same data set with the uh, um, lower resolution and enhancing the uh, diffuse extended emission, we see that indeed that there is a lot of extended slow surface brightness emission um, where, um, and so these filaments are actually fit, um, embedded in a lot of uh, uh, further emission. So the system is permeated by non-thermal plasma. And this is even clearer if we go at lower frequency. Uh, now I'm showing you on the right uh, a, a new LOPAR uh, image at 54 megahertz performed with the LOPAR low band antennas, where these, uh, all these uh, low surface brightness emission is even more clearly uh, detected. We combine then these two uh, data sets uh, to perform a spectral uh, distribution of the spectral index map of the source and investigate the spectral properties of this non-thermal plasma. And uh, we found a number of things. Uh, among these, uh, I mentioned th that uh, in the central region corresponding to the radio galaxy, to the central radio galaxy, we see spectral indices uh, um, in the range of 53, 144 megahertz that are in the range 0 0.6, 0 0.7. These are uh, values that are very much compatible with uh, active jets uh, and uh, that is with, partic with current um, particle reacceleration. Then when we move away, we see that the spectral index uh, is uh, steepening. Um, and is reaching values, very, very steep values of about 2.5 in the most uh, uh, peripheral regions. However, we don't really um, recognize a clear uh, smooth pattern of uh, spectral index. Instead, the distribution is very patchy. And this is uh, uh, probably suggesting us that the non-thermal plasma is interacting a lot with the ICM and uh, possibly turbulence is also playing a role here. Uh, finally, I just would like to underline the fact that the main filament in the north, the spectral index is uh, quite flat uh, with compar um, in comparison with the uh, surrounding emission with values of about 0 0.75, uh, 0 0.9. And this might suggest that some particle reacceleration is happening here. So what, what is this emission we are looking at? Uh, on large scales. So we think that all the emission is actually connected, uh, related to the uh, AGN recurrent activity that this system is uh, experiencing, and um, that this emission is, um, uh, let's say, the, the evolution is created by the evolution of bubbles of plasma ejected by the central AGN. Uh, we know indeed that uh, AGN uh, jet-driven bubbles, uh, um, even when they are born roughly spheric with roughly spherical shapes, let's say, then evolve into toroidal structures because of the pressure gradient that it's um, 
naturally surrounding them. Um, here you can see on the left some examples of, uh, let's say, real life uh, uh, bubbles evolving in, uh, uh, in different uh, situations and different related to different phenomena. For example, some explosions, some smoke rings, and even some bubbles ejected by um, some famous uh, volcano. Uh, in all these systems, you can see these toroidal structures, these vortex rings created um, uh, as a consequence of the movement of a bubble of fluid moving in another fluid. And from an astrophysical point of view, let's say, these uh, kind of structures uh, are very difficult to detect, but still we have a very um, impressive, amazing <laughs> example, I would say, in the very famous source M87, which is the, the central radio galaxy of the Virgo cluster. Here uh, we can see a very clear uh, mushroom structure that was uh, um, interpreted uh, uh, exactly as a rising bubble and evolving bubble. Um, after this uh, uh, M87 discovery, a lot of theoric theoretical uh, uh, effort and simulations have been uh, uh, performed in order to understand better the, the bubble evolution and its interaction, uh, its stability uh, and its interaction with the ICM, trying to understand better the coupling between the non-thermal and thermal plasma. And here I'm just mentioning a few and I'm just, and I'm just showing uh, one in particular by Young and collaborators in 2019. Uh, you see different time steps, uh, time snapshots, uh, and uh, I'm showing this because I think they're um, uh, might uh, might uh, uh, we, we we can find some similarities with uh, our radio emission uh, in the, in our group. So going back to the radio to the radio image, we can now interpret um, the the large scale emission as bubbles of uh, and and toroidal structures. Uh, uh, produced by the, the central AGN and moving uh, in, the, in the ICM. In particular, the main filament uh, that I was mentioning before, it's probably uh, a ring as seen edge on, uh, while the uh, box shaped structure, let's say in the north, uh, is probably, can probably be interpreted as a, a main bubble uh, uh, with a toroidal uh, uh, shape. In the south, instead, the, as already mentioned, the morphology is much more undefined, and this might be um, related to the fact that the bubbles uh, in the south uh, have been disrupted, uh, disrupted uh, uh, much more quickly with respect to the, the northern region of the, of the system. Two minutes. Of, thanks. Of course, uh, interactions with the, let's say, cluster dynamics uh, and uh, with the uh, large-scale environment, as also Franco was showing before in uh, his uh, simulations, uh, might have played an, an, uh, a role in, the, in shaping the morphology that we observe. Um, so given this interpretation, we can compute uh, a, a few numbers and few properties about the source. So first of all, we can derive that the buoyancy time of the main bubble in the north is about 500 mega years. And the same is more or less for the, for the ring, for the main ring in the north. Uh, however, uh, it's um, interesting to mention that the radiative time, which can be for, to further inferred by the spectral index uh, distribution shown before for the ring, uh, suggests a much uh, shorter time scale. And this is again suggestive of particle acceleration here uh, due to either turbulence, local turbulence, or by some kind of shock that has um, reaccelerated particles. Uh, such a shock could be maybe uh, be produced by the same uh, AGN recurrent activity. Uh, but of course, it's very difficult to test. Uh, on talking about uh, the, rate, the the powers of these uh, of these bubbles, 
the bubble, which I call B1, so the main one in the north, has a, a power of about 10 to the 42 Earth per second, uh, while the smaller one, uh, has a, which uh, is indicated as B2, is, uh, has a power of about 10 to the 39. So from this, we learn that uh, the main bubble in the north can actually be efficient to, to, uh, to prevent the gas cooling. Indeed, the, the power is consistent with the X-ray luminosity. However, not all the AGN outbursts seem to be effective for that. Uh, finally, we computed the first order uh, value for the non-thermal and thermal pressures, and we found uh, very comparable uh, values, suggesting that uh, these uh, uh, non-thermal plasma and these filaments are almost in pressure balance with the surrounding environment. The stability uh, of this system, if we really uh, interpret them as toroidal uh, structures, is really impressive. Indeed, we uh, would have expected that um, these, structure, these structures um, would have disappeared and destroyed by, ter by um, uh, instabilities on a much shorter time scales. Uh, however, magnetic fields may play a role in, uh, in, this, uh, in this stability. Indeed, the Alpen scale, uh, which is the, the scale at which under which magnetic fields play a role in uh, uh, preventing, let's say, instabilities, is about 5 to 15 kiloparsec, which is exactly the filament width. So this might suggest that magnetic fields play a role. So let me come to the con my conclusions. Um, so today I showed you a very spectacular galaxy group uh, where we have detected uh, impressive low for um, uh, radio low frequency uh, emission. The the class mm, sorry the galaxy group uh, is really permeated by um, non thermal plasma, and uh, we can see that the recurrent AGN activity is playing a major role in this. For the first time, we have uh, uh, detected a very very old phase of bubble evolution, much uh, later than uh, what observed served in M87. Uh, it's very impressive to notice the stability of these structures, and it's uh, very nice to um, point to the fact that uh, with low frequency, we are really able to get as close as possible to the moment where the actual mixing between the non-thermal plasma and the uh, thermal plasma is happening, making uh, maybe a little step forward in the understanding uh, of uh, feedback. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. That's a <laughs> Thanks. great talk and a, a beautiful source. Um, unfortunately, we, we are out of time for questions. I hope you can join uh, the coffee or the Slack clusters for yeah, uh, questions. And um, we can move on to our um, last speaker now of this session. Gabriela de Janeiro, uh, if you can share your screen, there you are. Yeah. Uh, can you see the screen? Great, yes, we can see it. Um, and it's full screen now. Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Gabriela Di Gennaro, and I'm a last year PhD student at Leiden University. And today I will uh, speak about a work that we have recently published um, uh, about uh, detection of uh, a collision between um, galaxy clusters located quite far away in the universe. So um, galaxy clusters are taught to grow and to assemble their mass via uh, merger events. Uh, these events are the most uh, energetic events that we can find in the universe after the, the Big Bang. And uh, they are the, mm, the events that um, are supposed to uh, bring uh, turbulence and uh, shock waves in uh, the intercluster inter medium um, in, in clusters. Uh, such um, processes 
are also thought to be linked with the presence of diffuse radiation, as Simona uh, described quite extensively uh, at the beginning of this session. And in particular, in this talk, I will mostly focus on uh, um, radio halos. So I will not repeat again what has been, done, has been uh, said um, several times today and also um, in, the, in, the previous, uh, in the previous sections. But what we think is that uh, the turbulence that is generated by the cluster mer is actually the, the responsible for the uh, acceleration of um, particles that are inside the ICM and therefore uh, uh, and amplify magnetic field uh, uh, inside the ICM to produce uh, uh, large scale diffuse radio emission that we call as radio halos. Of course, as Eric mentioned before, we all, there is also like the possibility that actually um, radio halos are uh, the product of uh, um, hadronic models. So the, the, the output from the collision between uh, protons and electrons, uh, although uh, the, the the fact that we uh, basically see uh, almost all the, um, the radio halos inside merging galaxy cluster uh, points towards uh, uh, the idea that has to be the, that cluster uh, mergers actually have um, play a major role in the generation of these sources. Uh, the other important thing about these um, sources is that those are not at least they are not observed to be polarized. And this is a problem when we uh, want to understand something about magnetic field because we cannot, <clears throat> we cannot actually uh, have a direct proof of magnetic field uh, from Faraday rotation, for instance, as has been shown this morning uh, in the previous section. So how do we know that um, uh, magnetic field is present in, uh, um, in galaxy cluster and how we can measure that? So what has been done usually, um, especially for uh, nearby objects, is to look at the um, rotation measure variation in, uh, coming from embedded or uh, background polarized sources. And here there is a, a one of the most famous examples from uh, the coma clusters by Annelisa Bonafede, uh, where basically uh, by looking at several radio galaxies within the, uh, the cluster radius, uh, it, was, it, it hasn't been possible to um, uh, to obtain a profile of, uh, of the magnetic field in this cluster. Of course, also assuming uh, a distribution of the electron density. So uh, the big question that uh, uh, we wanted to ask and we tried to, 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 to answer in, uh, uh, in my recent paper was if we can say something about magnetic field also uh, in uh, clusters that are not so nearby to us. Um, but uh, the, the first complication that comes from that is that if, uh, if we want to um, uh, use uh, the, the technique that I mentioned before uh, that has been done for the coma cluster, we will need to have uh, several, um, uh, several radio galaxies to perform um, a statistical studies of the variation of the rotation measure within the cluster, and you can uh, comparing these two uh, these two images showing one of the uh, pro the most actually uh, um, cluster that I have in in, uh, in my sample. You can actually see uh, the 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 problem that arises using the the, the Faraday rotation measurements from radio galaxies, and indeed is that uh, very simply that. Um, distant radio, uh, distant um, galaxy clusters are actually much more uh, small uh, in terms of uh, angular dimension than uh, the nearby objects. And therefore the, uh, the probability to detect even one background source, polarized background sources is, is very low. But uh, we know that, um, as I said before, that radio halos are uh, a combination between magnetic field and uh, very accelerated particles. So actually already the, 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 te the detection of uh, radio halos in these distant clusters can provide some sort of hints uh, for uh, magnetic field uh, in, uh, in the distant universe. So what is the problem of uh, detecting uh, radio halos at high redshift? Well, this, is this um, uh, depends on two uh, different factors. The first one is that uh, we expect that magnetic field decreases going uh, at high redshift. 
And the second one uh, is that uh, the, uh, at high redshift, the uh, energy losses due to synchrotron and inverse Compton actually uh, are uh, much more different with respect to the one that we have at low redshift. With the inverse Compton, uh, the um, uh, energy losses that are much more dominating uh, than uh, the local universe. And for this reason, what uh, uh, would we expect is that uh, at least at gigahertz frequencies, uh, the, the occurrence of radio halos in a galaxy cluster should be much lower. And uh, if uh, present, these, class, these halos should, uh, should have very, um, very low, a very steep spectral index. And this is also the reason why we don't actually see a lot of clusters, uh, there is a lot of halos in distant cluster is that uh, the current uh, radio telescope, the, the, at least the, the, the old generation of radio telescope, mostly uh, operates at gigahertz frequencies and they were not they are not sensitive enough to detect uh, if there are any um, diffuse radio emission from distant galaxy clusters so for this reason we actually took advantage from the um, LOFAR two meters uh, uh, sky su survey the lots um, uh, survey uh, which uh, is supposed, we, which is um, the thing which is observing the entire northern sky um, and therefore can actually provide us a, a larger sample of, uh, um, of cluster to um, to follow up. Uh, so the idea here was that to uh, observe, um, to select our clusters from uh, the Planck SZ catalog. And the reason why is that uh, this kind of catalog is uh, at least if we look at the, the broad and the full uh, redshift range should not be uh, biased by the dynamical state of the cluster. So we can, we are not actually in the, in the situation where we are only looking at uh, or preferentially looking at uh, um, either only cool core clusters where we are not expecting to detect halos or on the other side, we are not um, uh, only observing merging clusters. Uh, the other thing is that we don't, we don't put any kind of uh, um, threshold on the cluster mass. And therefore, again, we are not biased to the most powerful um, systems, which are also uh, supposed to, um, to host uh, more likely the, uh, the radio halos. Uh, and we only put like um, a threshold for the redshift of the clusters that had, um, had to be larger than 0.6 without putting any upper limit to that, although Planck intrinsically have uh, this kind of upper limit. And we also um, we also put a, a, a threshold on the declination of our observations just simply to, to match the best sensitivity of, uh, of lots. So here there is uh, like the, the final sample of our, um, uh, of our sec from coming from our selections, including uh, also in the black, uh, in, the, in the yellow square, you can also see the El Gordo, which is, as, uh, which is the most uh, decent uh, cluster so far uh, hosting uh, a radio halos and also a double radio relic. Uh, so the output of our uh, selection effects and, uh, is basically this one. Uh, here there is like a subsample of uh, uh, the diffuse radio emission that we find from, uh, from our sample where in some cases we can actually see a very nice example of diffuse radio emission larger than 500 kiloparsecs and for this uh, reason uh, classified as radio halos but also other situation where uh, the detection was um, was uh, basically unsure, uncertain because of the, uh, the sensitivity of uh, um, so the signal to noise of the detection itself or simply because the shape was not um, typical of radio halos. So in the end, what we found is that from 19 gal galaxy cluster from our sample, nine of, of these uh, hosted diffuse radio emission at, mega at megahertz frequencies, um, bringing uh, to uh, an occurrence rate of about 50%. So once we had this sample of, uh, of cluster, we could actually uh, measure the fluxes from this diffuse radio emission and to switch to um, radio power at 1.4 gigahertz to compare uh, the, uh, our results with, uh, with, with the literature. And what we found was very surprisingly because uh, we found that the radio power 
So the extrapolated radio power of our uh, distant clusters are actually very similar to uh, what we uh, what people actually found from uh, more local clusters. Uh, how is that possible was a little bit a puzzle because we were expecting something uh, intrinsically uh, fainter. Uh, but uh, so we have to keep in, in uh, we have to keep in uh, in mind that uh, actually uh, the uh, according to the acceleration the acceleration theory we can um, obtain uh, an inf uh, some information also about the magnetic field and uh, indeed if we assume re the re acceleration scenario we know that the radio power uh, is basically uh, a function that depends on the, uh, the turbulent uh, dissipation rate due to the cluster merger and from uh, the electron energy losses. And what it turns out is that uh, um, if we compare uh, the, uh, the radio power at low and high redshift, is that um, we have to keep in mind that the turbulent dissipation rate at high redshift is actually higher than the one uh, at uh, lower redshift, uh, um, and it's the same also for the electron energy losses that are stronger at, uh, um, at high redshift. These two terms sort of compensate each other, and for this reason we can actually draw magnetic field line in, uh, in the canonical radio power mass plot. Uh, Okay, yeah. Uh, and so we, uh, we could estimate uh, an average magnetic field for this uh, galaxy cluster, which, which is very similar to the one that we find at a much lower redshift. And this is very interesting because if you recall uh, the previous plot of the uh, simulated magnetic field that I showed before, uh, we should sort of come up with some sort of mechanism that uh, increase the, the plateau of constant magnetic field, um, also going to a higher redshift. So how is that possible? Um, so the basic idea for magnetic field amplification in galaxy cluster is the, the dynamo uh, amplification. And this kind of um, physical um, mechanism is basically divided into phases. The first one is called the kinetic uh, regime, uh, which basically uh, is where uh, the, uh, the amplification of magnetic field is dominated by the kinematics of the, uh, of the eddy that is generated during the, the cluster merger. The second phase um, is the so-called nonlinear regime, and happens when the, the energy, the, the kinetic energy and the magnetic energy basically uh, they are similar to each other. Um, the, the problem for this mechanism is that the first phase is also the slowest phases and only, only depends on the Reynolds number of the, uh, of, the, of the intercluster medium. So we could actually, um, given our values of magnetic field, we could actually give some sort of um, uh, information of the Reynolds number of this uh, high redshift uh, um, ICM. Uh, so what we found is actually, so we, we actually did, um, um, we tested two different situations. So the first one is the situation where uh, the magnetic, the seed of magnetic field come only from uh, um, the primordial field. So basically, uh, which is usually put uh, at, um, with values of one nano gauss, as also Franco showed before. And the other, um, the other situation is where uh, there is also contribution from the astrophysical um, objects, so like um, AGN, uh, galactic wind, uh, and uh, in general, a galactic outflow. And in this case, we start with magnetic fields of uh, about 0.1 micro gauss. And what we find is that if we start the magnetic field, um, so if the amplification of magnetic field starts exactly when the turbulence starts, Given the time, the, the age of uh, our uh, high edge clusters and the lower limit that we put from our observation, we came up that uh, the Reynolds number of the ICM in these high redshift clusters should be larger than 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 3, um, which is much higher than the canonical Reynolds number of 100 that is assumed in case of uh, um, Coulomb collisions. And this points to uh, 
uh, um, a very highly uh, turbulent ICM, which was also suggested by another recent paper uh, coming up, uh, coming out in uh, Nature Astronomy by Irina Zorleva and, to, and collaborators in 2019. Um, so uh, the the latest the, the last um, slides that, that I want to, to show to you is something actually that is in uh, work in progress, because as I mentioned before, the other puzzling part about high edge clusters is about their spectral indices. So uh, what we expect is actually according to the acceleration scenario is to observe uh, steep spectral index, and with steep I mean something that is uh, uh, steeper than um, minus point 1.3 or so. Uh, so uh, what we have now in hand are, uh, is a, a follow-up of all these clusters that I mentioned before with the, the upgraded GMRT in band three and four, which are the uh, wide band, the equivalent wide band of the previous uh, 325 and 610 megahertz. So uh, here I can I show you one of the best example of our LOFAR uh, image. And here those are the, the map, the preliminary map of the, the, the UGMRT observations. And as you can see, especially for the uh, band four uh, image, we reach a very, um, a very good uh, term, um, very good noise of about 10 uh, microjans per beam. And actually, we can we have uh, much more like uh, details and uh, um, depth in terms of detecting also point sources and uh, AGN. So uh, this is a still a work in progress. Uh, this kind of analysis has to be done also for uh, the all the other um, for all the other uh, targets. And in particular, we also plan to observe uh, some of these clusters with uh, the, J the JVLA. Um, of course, um, trying to uh, select the most brightest one uh, because otherwise it would be very difficult to detect these sources also with the JVLA. Um, so yeah, this is my summary, um, where, uh, ju where um, just to summarize, uh, we uh, detected for the first time like a high uh, magnetic field strength uh, in high energy clusters. And we could actually point to uh, a Reynolds number that is uh, surprisingly high in, uh, in the ICM and much larger than the one that is usually assumed from uh, cluster studies. Uh, the follow-up with the UGMRT will be very interesting to, uh, um, to study the spectral index study, uh, the, the spectral index of these, uh, of these sources, and which also, also is going to be a test for the reacceleration model. And last but not least, I did mention that, but of course it's quite implicit that we want to extend uh, this, uh, this sample because 20 clusters is not good for uh, a statistical study. And in this, in this situation, also the, the launch of Erosita will be, uh, will be very helpful because uh, the goal of this survey is indeed to study high redshift galaxy clusters. So we can actually have uh, a better sample, which uh, is, or at least a sample that is much more complete than uh, the one that we have now with, uh, with Planck. Uh, so I stop here and um, I'm taking your question. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, fantastic. Really nice to see those and the magnetic field results. Um, we have time for just one question, I think. And we have one um, actually in the uh, question window from Virginia. Um, do you already have an estimate of the spectral index of the halo for which you showed the GMRT image? Um, so um, for this particular cluster, uh, a rough estimate will be actually of a spectral index of minus 1.3, which is rather regular for radio halos. Although I can uh, suspect that this particular cluster is quite um, peculiar uh, because it's the brightest cluster that we have from in, uh, in this sample. Uh, so I will not use this one as um, a representation of from the full sample. Uh, so um, I still don't have like the, the images from uh, from the other clusters. So I cannot give you um, a, a proper answer to that. Uh, 
Uh, but it's also interesting to, to note that for this cluster in particular, um, where there is also a, um, a suggestion of the presence of radio relic, the radio relic look to be uh, steeper uh, than minus 1.3, so something like minus 1.6, um, which is indeed expected from distant uh, diffuse radio emission. Great. Well, thank you. I'd like to actually thank all, all the speakers again for the session. It was a really great session. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's online to, um, if you haven't put in a lightning talk and please do so. There are some really great lightning talks already up there to have a look at. And um, now we could go over to the coffee break and continue discussions. Thank you.